you don't need a gift in anything you choose to do in order to excel, right? Because we all have a gift. It's called the gift of work. Welcome to Ultra Habits. Here, we go under the hood with our guests to unpack the minutia and to understand what processes and systems they engage or research that result in ultra-enhanced living. Hey, Leia. Welcome to the Ultra Habits podcast. Uh, we are... Here in Melbourne, Victoria, I know you're in British Columbia. We've had some time zone coordinating. I think there's a 19 hour difference, but we are so (laughs) grateful to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. (laughs) Yeah, look, we came across you on the Rich Roll podcast and what a remarkable story, an untold story and we want to unpack that on the show today we know our audience is going to love and really resonate with your journey you're a general badass and we want to really get to the mechanisms you know what makes leia goldstein tick that's what we're talking about today all right sounds good (laughs) so let's take it way back so you have an interesting backstory your mom is chinese and your dad is russian but you were, were you born in Israel? No, I was at, well, I was made in Israel. I was born here. My, my mom was seven months pregnant. So I was in the oven still. <laughs> what, what I'm dying to know, because I'm a, I'm a bit of a, um, you know, I'm a bit of a geograph- geographical nerd. So was your mom Israeli or Chinese? No. Well, they were Chinese and then they emigrated to Israel when the communism came into the country. They had to, that, that was their escape, right? So they ran away to Israel, they immigrated, they converted, and then, you know, she grew up Jewish. So they, were, they weren't born Jewish, your dad no. or your mom? No, my father, yes. My father came from a uh, Jewish background. Got uh, it. Yeah. And then my mother from, from China, from Northern China. Was it, have you ever spoke to your mom about being Chinese in Israel? Was that interesting for her? Um, I mean, I think, I mean, their mother tongue was actually Russian because in Kurja, where they were, where, you know, she was up to 14 years old. Um, that's what they spoke. Chinese, they kind of, mm-hmm. was their second language, right? So when they came to Israel, there was lots of immigrants from China coming into there. So, you know, it kind of felt like home for her. It's just that they were very prosperous in China. And then they came to Israel basically with nothing. So they had to, you know, kind of redevelop themselves in a new foreign country, new people, new culture. So, you know, it was from the bottom kind of work your way up. But my grandfather went back into farming like he was in in China. Right. Okay. And so what was your, your parents' story? Like, what did your dad, I understand he was a boxer, right? Yeah. When he was in the military, he was a boxer. Yeah. So he was, he's actually a national champion when he was 18 years old. He's very small though. He's like 118 pounds. I think that's bantamweight or something. Very petite, man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so reflecting on that, like I know that your, your grandfather, I believe he was a, a Holocaust survivor. Mm-hmm. How did your parents shape you were really interested in kind of the the nurture piece. Like, what did you get from your mom? What did you get from your dad? Just uh, well, reflecting think, on that. Yeah, I mean, they were tough and strict. Um, and because we were, you know, they came to Canada. Their English wasn't very good. You know, my dad had a hundred bucks. My sister was three. Like I said, I was in the oven. You know, <laughs> my mom just had coven. You know, cousins here. So you know, they had to work pretty darn hard. And I mean, he just went from factory to factory, and all he could say in English was, uh, "I need work. I need work." Right. So you know, when you grow up and you see what your parents had to go through in order to succeed, you know, you kind of follow in their footsteps. Footsteps. But he really implemented to my sister and I that. Um, you need to be independent and you need to always care for yourself and not to run for others when you need help. Right. So, you know, independence and and using your noodle, you know, through Mm. life um, was very important for us, you know, so we didn't get handouts or anything like that. Or if we were in trouble, we had to figure things out. And it was really important for him to, so we, we grew up in that sense of really independent, strong, independent women. What's your sister like? 
She's, no. I mean, she didn't go in the athletic route. You know, she's more artistic. She's very good in art, you know, in drawings and paintings. Um, way more quiet than I am. She went into school, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, you know, she has a son. Her son is autistic. So that kind of changed her life. You know, when you have a special needs child that comes into your life, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, 90 degree turn, right? So, mm. yeah, I mean, her, we, we both kind of went different paths. But again, when I was, you know, 17, 18, I left Canada and I went to the Middle East. And I honestly didn't have a lot of contact with my family for almost almost 12 years. Mm, and we're going to get there. We're going to we're going to take the 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 slow route to get there, though, because there's okay. so much in your story. Like you you got into Taekwondo. Now, from what I understand, that was on the back of bullying. Is that right? Oh, yeah. When I was like, like, again, in, you know, in elementary school, I was in, in grade two or something like every lunch hour between like 12 and 1245, me and my best friend, Matthew, was just, you know, another boy kind of red stringy hair and freckles <laughs> we were chased by a group of eight boys. And we couldn't tell teachers because, you know, back then you don't tattletale. You're off, often taught figure things out for yourself. And like I said, couldn't tell my parents. No way. I mean, you know got to figure things out for yourself. So I ended up coming home one day and I got one hour of television as I'm flicking through, you know, to find my show, you'll know Gilligan's Island in my yes. generation. <laughs> so I was looking for Gilligan's Island and I come across it and, you know, this one channel and I see this young, small Asian man fighting five, 10, 15 people. And my eyes get big. I go, damn, he can fight <laughs> off 30 people. I only have to fight off eight. What is he doing? Right. So he was doing Kung Fu. It was Bruce Lee. And that's how I got into Taekwondo. I begged my mother for lessons and, you know, and so she found a Taekwondo studio that wasn't far from where I was living. And that's kind of how it started from there. From what I understand, like I'm not a martial artist, but I understand that Taekwondo is one of the more aggressive fighting styles on the spectrum. Like, how did you get into Taekwondo in particular? Was it like a, just a coincidence that it was Taekwondo? Actually, yeah, it was. Well, I mean, honestly, it was the closest, you know, a martial arts studio that my mother could find. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, um, and in all honesty, Taekwondo is a Korean form of self-defense and it is more traditional. It's when I transitioned to the kickboxing. And the reason why I transitioned to the kickboxing is because I had got too many red card, you know, got red carded a lot for too much contact during the sparring matches. Right. Because most martial arts like, you know, karate, kung fu or, you know, jujitsu or whatnot, it's not full contact. It's, you know, it's semi contact. And so, you know, it's like more of the art form of it. It's still a great form of self-defense, but it's not really the real deal. So you're in Taekwondo mm -hmm. and you're kicking everyone's ass. How did you then transition to kickboxing? Like, did you know about kickboxing? Did you watch like Jean-Claude Van Damme and the kickboxing no, movie in the 80s? No. Like, what, what was that no, story? Not at all. Not at all. I mean, I excelled in, in Taekwondo very fast. By the time I was 12 years old, I was a junior national champion. And at that age, boys and girls, they fight together up until 13. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't feel challenged anymore. So another black belt had suggested to me, you know, you should try kickboxing. And another reason why is because I was very good at boxing skills because my father, as you know, was a, was a boxing champion and I grew up watching boxing. You know, we didn't, I didn't watch football or soccer or hockey, but most, you know, North American kids watch, we watch boxing. And my father is very animated. You know, he taught me the way they stand, the way they punch, the way they move. So when you mix Taekwondo and boxing, you get more of a kickboxer, right? Mm. You know? And so then I, that's kind of how the kickboxing started with a suggestion. And then me kind of riding, my bike across town to skid row and finding this kickboxing studio so you get to the studio what happens well i get to this studio and you know, i kind of have a big head because i'm I, you know, i'm junior national champion second degree black belt and so the coach there you know he sees this overconfident teenager and he wants to teach me a lesson right you know because i start bragging about myself and so he puts me into a boxing ring and he brings in this kick kickboxer about half my size and i think damn i'm gonna kill him but it was his most skilled kickboxer, right? You know, and as we're standing there, he throws a jab and it hits me in the face. And I've never hit, been hit like that before. And I start throwing my best moves and nothing's making contact. And it was not good, right? And I'm getting frustrated. So the coach, Alan Chang, the coach, you know, he, he grabs me, takes me to the side. And he goes, you go home and you think about it, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember going home and feeling totally deflated because for me, being able to defend myself was very important. I mean, it did stop all the bullying at school. And it wasn't the physical part. It was the mental part. Because, you know, when you have, you know, mental strength is much more powerful than physical. But just having that stop the situation I had at school. 
And so I remember riding my bike. Remember, I'm 12 years old, feel totally deflated. I didn't want my mom to see me. I opened the door. My mom's standing there. And the first words that come out of my mouth is, mom, I'm going to be a kickboxer. Next mm. day, I rode my bike and I went back to that damn studio. <laughs> so I want to know, when, you're, when you were a kid, did you, reflecting back, did you have a unique relationship and capacity to deal with fear? Um, like what was going on there? Like how did you deal with the psychological piece of fighting and get so good so quick? Right. Like I just. Well, I mean, listen, when I, I had a hard time going back now to my childhood, like I had a learning disability. Like when I was in school, I didn't get it. They put me in a special class. I didn't know the language very well. I spoke with the lisp on the physical side. My left leg was growing at a faster rate than my right leg. It's stronger. It's longer. The foot is bigger and I don't have full mobility where the ankle is. So, you know, you got a double whammy there. And, you know, teachers told my mom that I'd never excel in sports, mm -hmm. never be a doctor, you know. So, and I knew that as a kid, that would anything that I choose to do, that I have to work twice as hard to get there. But I never let it dictate my path because I knew what I had to do and I knew what I was good at. And that's what I focused on. Mm. Yeah. And when you started kickboxing, mm -hmm. your coach made a, pretty interesting commitment to you, right? Like he, he thought you would become a champion. Now you, I, 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 in one of the, your interviews, I heard uh, you say to um, the interviewer that the coach said to you that you'd be a champion by the age of 17. Is that right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Like when I walked back into that studio, he wasn't surprised to see me. Right. Cause I honestly, I got a little bit of a licking when I, you know, when I left yeah. the day before and he basically sits me down and he says to me, cause he saw something in me, right. He goes, you want to do this, right. And remember his English isn't very good. He says to me, no smoking, no drinking, no drugs, no friends, no swear, train seven days a week, train twice a day. And you do that. Then he says 17, you world champion. Remember, 12, 13 years old, that's a lot of commitment, right? But I was in. I was, you know, and I learned at that age, what does it take to be the best at anything you choose to do? And that's 110%. And I basically used that form, that principle with other things that, you know, came my way as life progressed. It is. It's, it's lasering in and 110%. And I knew as a kid, too, mm -hmm. that, you know, friends and good times, they're always going to be around, but unique and special opportunities won't. And that's what I went. Because, you know, those sacrifices are worth the payoff at the end. How did you have the view of the long game so young? I think it's just something that intrigued me, right? And I, and something that I really wanted to do, I, I had a passion for it. Like I love the Taekwondo and I want to take it one step further. And I knew that I had a special gift for that particular sport because when I was in the ring, as crazy as this may seem, I knew exactly when I would throw any kind of, you know, combination of attacks, kicks, punches, whatnot, I knew the reaction I'd get from my opponent and how they'd react back. And I'd play it in my head. And 99% of the chance, you know, the times I would get it right. You know, that's why I was undefeated coming up into, you know, my 17, at 17, I was undefeated and my training was very intense. Like Ellen Chang, we use really unconventional form of training. I would spar blindfolded, right? You know, he'd use bamboo sticks kind of to numb the, the nerves on the shins, that kind of that, you know, those old traditional <laughs> forms of training, you know, and I was in like, I, I ate, breathed, slept kickboxing. That's all I did. I trained, I didn't train twice a day, you know, seven days a week. I trained three times a day, seven days a mm. week. And your dad, he must have realized he somehow created this. But at the same time, I believe he did he, he wasn't necessarily happy you were doing this. What was that engagement process like with your dad? Well, because you know boxing kickboxing it can be a little bit of a dirty sport right like promoters when you have big fights mm. they like to do mixed matches because the crowd likes to see somebody get you know beat up pretty darn good right <laughs> and it happens that's a great crowd because don't forget like the crowds like when i was kind of working my way up to you know the higher rankings and becoming a professional i had to do these little small fights in little small towns and the crowds were like the hell's angels really tough mm. you know what i mean and they like to see the blood right you know so he was just concerned of my safety, right? You know, going into the sport, just him knowing the background. He didn't want me to be a boxer. I mean, he thought it was great that I could defend myself, but he just kind of wanted me to stop right there. And he actually changed his tune 
when he um, when he kind of watched one of my fights and saw, wow, you know, I do have unique skill. And he started he did one training session with me because he built me a gym in the backyard in the you know in our garage. And then he said that he saw some something unique that he's never seen before. So that's when I kind wow. of won my father over. So it actually took some time for your dad to come aware oh, yeah. of how good you were. Like he didn't oh, even yeah. know. Oh my gosh, I had to sneak out of the house to go to these fights, right? So I can, you know, work my way up to work to a, to be the provincial champion, the national champion, and the world champion, North American, you know. So yeah, I had to like I lied to to my dad. I go, yeah, it's going to your friends or whatever. That's know? crazy. Most teenagers are sneaking out to get high and drunk, and you're yeah. sneaking out to go fight. You got it. That's exact. My mother knew because my mother was always on my side, right? So I had I had an ally with me. <laughs> yeah, that's that tends to be the way. Just don't tell dad, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Coach Ching is it? Yeah, Coach Ching. Coach Ching, yeah, Alan. Yeah, Chang. like so, Alan Ching. So you said in one of your interviews that he only focused on what you weren't doing well. Mm -hmm. So like he always pushed you to optimize. Do you, re reflecting on that, do you think that everyone would respond well to that? Like, did that impact your confidence or did that make you want to try harder or, or a bit of both? Well, he was, he was, excuse me, he was a hard ass coach. Let me just put it that yeah. way. Right? Like he never focused on what I was good at. He never complimented me. He only focused at the things that I could be better at. Cause you know what I was doing? I needed to be perfect, right? I mean, it's a full contact sport, right? Even, you know, Angie, when I won the world championship, you know, kickboxing, he said to me, he whispered in my ear after the fight, he goes, you could have done better, right? And I knew I could have done better, right? Because I think we know what we're good at. We don't have to gloat and blow ourselves up and make our heads big for nothing. We have to focus on the things that we're not good at. And I think that's important, right? You know, I think is because, you know, I think, you know, when you're, when you're good at something, you know, you can get this cocky attitude, you know, and having confidence is good. But when that confidence turns to cockiness, that's when you're going to get hit hard and you're going to fail. When you're competing at an elite level, and everyone's strengths are at a at a certain level. I guess what you would probably agree with is that it's about who's been able to sharpen their weaknesses, right? Like, I mean, when you're when you're fighting or when you're dealing with opponents or you're in a landscape where you're much better because of natural talent, mm -hmm. but when you get to that place where everyone's kind of similar, it's about well, who's actually worked at rounding themselves out, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, like for kickboxing, it is a unique sport because for one, we could study the opponents who we're fighting. We can learn their skill, you know, what, I mean? what, what she's weak at. So there's a lot of elements to it. Right. I mean, I think with all the sports that I had done in my life, kickboxing was probably one of the most difficult. Right. You know, because it works every element, you know, your cardiovascular, your flexibility, your speed, your strength, you know, your agility. And you have to stay on top of it. And you can't afford to have a bad day in the ring. You have to have a very good day or else, you know, you're knocked out. Right. So it's a lot of pressure, but it's very precise. Like the training was very specific and we worked very specific and I never budged on anything. Like if I had to do two or three hours in the gym, it's usually three and a half to four hours. Right. You know, and I really followed the principle of what our goal was and that was to be be the world best the world best at 17 years of age have you did you ever fight in thailand i did not no is it different there well thai like, boxing is a little bit kickboxing is different because you wear the padded gloves and the and the uh safety kicks right yeah whereas yeah. thai boxing it's it's just a pair of shorts <laughs> all <laughs> no. right okay so it's it's yeah. similar but different yeah they're different sports yeah all yeah. right okay okay all right so you're you become world champion at 17 right correct yes and so why do you bail on the sport like what 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 made you shift out of that space well the funny thing was is that alan chang my coach his kind of dream for me and goal for me wasn't to be was to get the world championships kind of have that title and then do movies in china <laughs> you know what I mean? like bruce lee <laughs> Exactly. That's what his goal oh, is that? for me, you know, because he didn't want me. That's why he didn't want me to fight too much, you know, get too beat up in my oh. face or whatever. You know? That was his goal. However, my goal was a little bit different that I never told anybody because, you know, my focus and goal from as young as I could remember, it wasn't to be Bruce Lee or this world kickboxing champion. You know, Bruce Lee was just a solution to a problem. I knew that when I finished my kickboxing career that I would go back to Israel and I would work for some form of intelligence. I mean, I wanted to be James Bond. That's what I wanted to do. And I never told anybody what my goal was 
I didn't tell my coach. I didn't tell my parents. I just knew that I was going to go back and I would do something in that line of work. Mm. So what did you do? Well, I went back, you know, I left Canada at, you know, after I won the world championships and I enlisted in the IDF, the Israel Defense Force. And that's kind of how my career in Israel started. I've always had a question about that. Like the local governments, like when you go to the Israeli Defense Force, are they, is the Canadian government okay with that? Like, do they wonder like, what have you done <laughs> when you try to get back to Canada? Like what, was that a major process? <laughs> no, no, I, no, it's not. I mean, it would be more of a process of why would I want to go to the IDF when I live in Canada, right? You know, I think they were more concerned about that. But you know, I mean, every Canadian citizen, you can go to any country. I think it's not, you know, you're not stopped. It's not a communist country. So yeah. that, I mean, there was never a concern from Canada, but when I was being recruited, they were quite, you know, concerned of what they want to know why I wanted to, to go and do this because a lot of kids, they don't want, I mean, you know, in Israel, it is mandatory to do the service. Women do two years and men do three years, whether you like it or not. And then men continue to do their service up into 45, you know, for every year it's called, um, uh, Miluim, right. You know, women to a depending on your position. So a lot of kids, they don't really look forward to that yet. I'm leaving Canada and I'm coming to Israel and I'm diving into the IDF. Right. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's kind of concerning for, I guess, you know, the security of, of that department, like what, what, what does this kid want? Right. So you, you kind of skip what is the traditional basic training, right? Like what was the process when you get there? I know there's this base A maybe explain to us what that is, but what was the actual process when you get there and sign up in terms of well, physical yeah, I mean, training and all that? Well, I mean, there is a selection process um, when you go into the military, right? I mean, everybody has a unique quality that the military can use, right? You know, so I was put through a selection process of 340 recruits, you know, and they put, take us through and they test us psychologically, physically, you know, and we go through different exercises, different operations. And then they start cutting us down from 350, it goes to 150, then 100. And then there was 10 of us, right? And then we were put into a, like a, an enhanced basic training per se, you know, where it was a little bit more intense, taught a little bit more skilled. And then when I graduated from there, I was I think I, I set the new record at that time for, you know, the um, the obstacles that they were doing, the testing that they were doing. I just blew it out of proportion of what the other recruits had done in the past. And so from there, right away, they recruited me or they positioned me into base eight. What is base eight? Base eight is a... Um, it's a, it's a base where a lot of the military intelligence train, like the commandos would come for training, the pilots would come for training, most more of the elite soldiers, officers, lieutenants, you know, would come in to do specific, specific type of training. And during and I was actually positioned in a, in a unit called Krav Maga. Now, I don't know if you've heard of that term before, but Krav Maga is a system of fighting designed for soldiers. Let's say if your ammunition jams, like how to use a rock, a stick, a stone in the most, most lethal way. And every soldier learns this form of self-defense. So you don't have to be, you know, 220 pounds to be dangerous, right? You can still be quite lethal, even at 140 or 120 pounds or whatnot. So anyways, I was in that department. And then from there... I was transitioned or um, repositioned to train the most elite unit called the commando. So I was the first woman to be, you know, recruited to train the commando. Mm. I've always wanted to know with Krav Maga, from mm -hmm. a technical perspective, what's it most similar to? And is it actually applicable? Like, could you, could there be competition around Krav Maga or it's not relevant for like competition based fighting no, no 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 because i mean the objective is to eliminate your you know your opponent right or your you know whoever you're coming across right so it's a dangerous form of, of self-defense when your life is at stake right you know so i don't yeah. see how you could right i mean but mind you in the training though i mean we would take two soldiers and we'd let them go at it till one was like you know almost knocked out whatever because sometimes you have to be in that position to feel like what's it like when you have no oxygen can't you know you can't yeah. breathe or whatever so you have to get out of that panic mode and do what you have to do in order to survive, right? So it's yeah. very a unique and specific form of self-defense. And I don't see how you could do a competition. No, because I, I don't know anything about fighting, but in my head, for some reason, I picture like this kind of MMA style of like holds and whatnot. 
It's it, probably similar to that with one step further, right? You know, he's, he's trying to kill the dude. <laughs> All right, you know, okay. Like, oh, here's the yeah. wrong. You know, okay. <laughs> so, so they, so they loved you, right? Like he's this this uh, young girl from Canada, yeah. and you're a kickboxing champ, a taekwondo champ. And you're there voluntarily. So you're like willing, the, willingly willing right. to do what needs to be done. How did just is a matter of interest, like how did you connect or not connect to the local kind of Israeli girls in like, was that a challenge? Like, were they there with the same mentality as you or what, like, what no, was I mean, that? I mean, don't like, all my family is in Israel, right? You know, I mean, yeah. just my parents, my parents came here. So all my, 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 you know, aunts and uncles and cousins, they're in Israel, yeah. right? You know, so we mm -hmm. did go back every year. So I right. know the mentality, right? You know, but I've always been kind of, you know, an introvert kind of by myself and, you know, not super social and all that and whatnot. So, you know, I think for, for what I wanted to do, I was, the right profile for them. You know what I mean? So I wasn't a big party person. I didn't like to, you know, to be seen or whatnot, you know, and if I'm in a party, I'll, I'll be there. You won't even know I'm there. So I think my personality was kind of suited for the things that I wanted to do. And mm -hmm. I think I was just so good physically too, that they'd never seen a woman be able to do those things that, you know, that men can do because, you know, I, I prepared myself you know, coming from Canada, I knew kind of the training that I needed to do. And also the training I did with Alan Chang. I mean, you know, I was, mm. I was very agile and, and very strong for, for my size. Mm. And so you, you end up joining the Belush unit. Am I saying right? The Belush That's unit? after the military. Correct. After the military. Okay. So, yeah. uh, okay. So what, just give, give us a flavor of the military career and how you ultimately got to the Belush unit. Right. Well, from, when I was in base eight, you know, I mean, as I said, I was a commando instructor and I was also sent on different operations to work with some intelligence units, which I don't know their specific name or whatever. It was just, I was, you know, when you're sent on assignment, they just give you what you're supposed to do. And, and that's all you're told, right. You know, put you on a bus and then you come back and that's it. So, you know, I did that for about a year and then I, I wanted to transition into the police force because I, like you said, I, um, volunteered to the military because I needed the skills the military would teach me in order to do the things that I need, you know, that I would need to do later on, like, you know, using M16 and Uzi guns, weapons, Krav Maga, whatnot. You need those skills. You know, you can't go into the police force without the idea. And that was my motivation to go into the army. But, you know, I ended up ex excelling, you know, and doing things that I didn't think I wouldn't be doing. So from there, um, during that time, there was a huge immigration from the Soviet Union into Israel. I don't know if you remember, Gorbachev released 1.6 million Jews. And with that huge immigration, you know, um, crime started to escalate that Israel never faced before, such as narcotics, prostitution, drug trafficking. You know, we deal with terrorism. That's the Middle East. That's what, you know, 80, 90 percent of our, you know, security system deals with. And then the mafia comes in. So the commissioner wanted to create a secret police force in order to deal with that to, the, to that situation, because honestly, the country started to crumble. Right. You know, and we can't afford not to be strong. And so I wanted to be recruited into to that particular um, operation that was happening, that course that was happening. And so that's kind of how my transition happened from the IDF into the police force. Right. So. Gorbachev released 1.6 million prisoners, you say? No, no immigrants. Immigrants. Yeah. Okay. But a lot right, of but those, yeah, but a lot of those immigrants, like you said, like, you know, they came in with fake documentation mm -hmm. and 23% of them were criminals, right? So you can imagine, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, like the paperwork probably wasn't as, you know, <laughs> as secure yeah. as it would be now, right? And mm -hmm. that's what was happening, right? I mean, you know, you're in this country and the government too was supporting these immigrants with, with money as well. So a lot of those immigrants that took the funding, government funding, also left the country to come <laughs> into Canada and to the United States. So you can imagine what, you know, all hell just broke loose, mm -hmm. you know, and so the government and the commissioners and the police force, they all got together and said, we have to, you know, get a hold of this. So they created this secret police force in order to deal with this issues, you know, as fast as possible. And that's what I wanted to be recruited into. Got it. So when you were a cop mm -hmm. in Israel, like it's very difficult for someone that like myself that hasn't been to Israel because you have this view of like the Holy land and there's just so many different dynamics, but you forget, like there's, there's just regular people, there's good parts and bad parts. Like, was it 
like was would it have been the same issues that you know a beat cop in LA would have like or was it like dynamic like you have terrorism and then in the same night there's drugs and like what what were the type of things that you were dealing with as a cop <laughs> well I think it's quite different right <laughs> you know what I mean I mean we do deal with terrorism like you know with us like you know when you go into a store um you know we check your bags before or here or you check your bags when you go out right you know <laughs> so there's a difference there and if you see a suspicious object it's a suspicious object you're very cautious right you can't leave a bag in Israel and just go and go to the bathroom or whatever. You know what I mean? So, I mean, part of our routine as when I was just a regular police officer at the beginning, we checked garbage cans, bus stations, wow. you know, because back then it was a lot of times where they'd plant bombs and, you know, at, in buses was a big one, bus stations and schools in the um, outlet centers, the malls, you know, the indoor malls, you know. So that's the type of security that we did. I did as a regular police force. So it, it is very, very different, right? You know, whereas in the States, I mean, you have mm -hmm. more, I think, with um, like gang related yeah. issues, you know. Yeah. Um, so, it, you know, it's just different. It's a different form of, of security for sure. So I know that you had ambitions to kind of get into uh, Israel's secret service uh, industries, I guess you could say that ultimately it, it didn't happen. And I know that you were quite disappointed, but through that process, you were introduced to the bike right mm -hmm. well actually actually i was introduced to the bike in the back in the idf right there was a oh. lieutenant from the commando um who was also the national champion in the sport of triathlon so he's the one who got me into duathlon because there was no bike racing back then so i continued to you know to compete as a duathlete i mean he was my coach i was a national champion for two years and that's kind of where where I start to fall in love with the bike, but that was just kind of a side note for, you know, during this time, during the police and you yeah. know, the police, which is a spying agency that I worked for. And then later on, about 11 years later, I had decided that I wanted to be a pro racer. When you were a cop, mm -hmm. would you go for long bike rides? Well, okay, a regular cop, well, the thing is, <laughs> This the system of how it works in Israel is when they say you're going on a 12 hour shift, it's not a 12 hour shift. It's when you're finished. Right. You know what I mean? So your 12 hour shift can sometimes be 24 hours. Right. Or it can be 15 hours or it can be whatnot. Right. So I tried to squeeze it in as much as possible when I had these little bumps here and there, you know. And then you get one day um, off per week, which is, mm -hmm. you know, on Shabbat Sunday, sundown on Friday till sun up on Saturday. So I'd use that to really train. So honestly, I squeezed it in when possible. But don't forget, though, the job that I did, we had to be fit. So mm. we were training, you know, you can't, you know, you, you can't afford mm. to let yourself go because we're running a lot. We have to learn how to use our weapons. You have to have a strong body. So that wasn't really a big issue. I just incorporated cycling into the training that was required in order to do the job that I was doing. What did cycling give you that was different than fighting? I mean, it's just, it was my therapist, right? It was a therapy. Like, you know, when you're going out there and it's just you and the bike and the wind and you can go out and you don't care about anything else and the adrenaline is pumping, right? Um, so it's a sense of freedom for sure. And that's what I kind of found my salvation on the bike. And it was, you know, whenever I had a bad day or I, oh, I had a problem that I had to figure out, mm. I'd get on the bike and I'd ride and I'd th think about anything else mm. and I'd come back and I'd figure it out. Right. You know, mm. so yeah, it, it did. It meant a lot to me and I, and I loved it. And I, you know, and the more I got into it, the more I just wanted to ride full time. Mm. I, I suppose with fighting, it's not like a meditation when you're running or on a cycle because you have to be fully focused on your opponent as well. Like there's no switching off, is there? Like, no. yeah, you're not gonna go. You're not gonna go to a fight. Yeah, it's it's not like you're going to a fight to just switch off and have your layer time, right? Like right. you can't do that, right? No. 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 Well, it's different. I mean, look, when you're in the pollution stuff, your job is very dangerous. So we're armed all the time. Right. Mm. You know what I mean? So it's a different mentality and it's hard to switch that off. Like when I'm done my shift or, or assignment or, or operation or whatever I'm doing, you know, I go back to my vehicle and I'm not really 
you know, off duty. I'm still checking around my car. I'm checking inside my vehicle, checking to see if anyone's following me. You know what I mean? So you, you know, because of what we do, it's still a dangerous job, right? That's why, you know, we're required not to associate with other people, not to have friends, not to discuss what you do. So you're never really off duty, right? So to some degree, it kind of eats eats at you, you know, so you're always kind Mm. of in that frame of mind. Even when I would ride my bike, I rarely went anywhere unarmed. I think as a woman too, when you're dealing with, you know, uh, potential terrorism and terrorist regimes, it's even more of a unique challenge as a potential target. Right? Oh, 100 <laughs> You yeah. know, like you're a much more valuable target is an yeah. Israeli female. Oh, yeah. Cop. And like it would be a disaster if you were taken, right? Oh, yeah. And that's the, the big... Um, <laughs> The, the big, uh, what do you call it? The warning that they give you prior to, right? You know, that mm. you're better off ending your life probably than going through mm. whatever you're going to be going through, right? So I realized that in the beginning, right? So that's a big step that you have to take and not to, to think about it too much, right? You mm. know, so it is mentally, it's not for everyone. Let me just tell no. you that, right? No. You know, it's it's no. not for everyone. It'd definitely be some paranoia, post, post-traumatic post paranoia right. from like, yeah. you know. So you... You you decide to go back to Canada, right? You retire from being a cop and you have this vision at 30 to become a pro cyclist. You won some races in Israel. So you yeah. get back to Canada, Lay is <laughs> here, I'm gonna do it. What happens? And I get my ass kicked. <laughs> I get my ass. I mean, I would go into these races. And I would come in so last that I wouldn't oh, even no. know where the finish was because oh. everybody would go. I'd see my car in an empty parking lot and I go, okay, damn, that must be it. Right. You know, mm. because listen, I came from Israel and I was winning races. There. I was a big fish in a small pond. Right. You know what I mean? I didn't have much competition. I mean, mind you, I did compete with the men, but even, you know, it's, it's not comparable, right. To people who yeah. train full time. So yeah, I mean, it was a, a lesson, a big lesson. Like when I got to Canada, I wasn't wear, welcomed with, you know, warm and fuzzy. Oh yeah. Come to the Federation. They basically told me right from the get go, I was too old. You know, I basically missed the boat. I was too big for climbing, too small for sprinting. I didn't have the right mentality that I could probably just be an age grouper. Right. So, you know, I mean, and that was a hard transition because up until that point, I kind of excelled at everything I did. But now Mm -hmm. I really wanted to be this pro racer. And I, first of all, I wasn't very good or talented. Right. You know, Mm -hmm. and I didn't have a hell of a lot of support. But, you know, the interesting thing is with everything I've done in my life, nothing kicked me, you know, more physically or mentally or beat me up more than the bike, right? And really taught me what the human body is capable of doing, Mm -hmm. you know? And I also proved the important part here is that you don't need a gift in anything you choose to do in order to excel, right? Because we all have a gift. It's called the gift of work, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what I had to do in order to, you know, to get to where I wanted to, not being the super talented person. I had to work three times harder. And, you know, I didn't come to that realization till I hit professional cycling. What makes your story so remarkable is at the front half, like, you know, a listener would be like, well, Leia is just super talented with fighting, right? She just gets it. She was born into it. She gets it. She just kicks ass. But then you get into this thing where you suck and you're able to stay with it. And like a lot of really good athletes that have a fixed mindset Mm -hmm. wouldn't be able to deal with that level of failure. Mm -hmm. Right. Whereas you're, you've got this growth mindset where I'm sure it impacted you because you're like so used to being good at everything, but somehow you viewed it as an opportunity and you didn't bail. And you did that for eight years, right? Like, Oh, my God. I got <laughs> it's yeah, like a I long time. Humiliated. humiliated. Like, I mean, it took me a heck of a long time to really excel. And honestly, the thing that changed for me, I mean, I'm now 38 years old. And people are saying, you know, Goldstein, what the hell are you doing? Right? You know what I mean? Maybe you should just write the ride with master's group or whatever, right? And so I was riding for a professional. I mean, I'm making my sound, myself sound worse than what I really was. I was a good support rider, right? Yeah. But I was humiliated kind of in one of the races. I heard one of the directors who's the director of the biggest U.S. team talk about a rider, right? And he said something to the effect of when the road goes up, she drops down. So he's referring to climbing. And those five words that completely changed my life was Goldstein, that's my last name, can't climb worth shit. And everyone starts laughing, not just him, other coaches, other writers, other oh, directors. Yeah. Like it was the funniest thing they've ever heard, right? And that to me 
was a wake up call of going, okay, you know what, what are you going to do about it? Right. Because you know what, because I think though, listen, when, when Mm. we are criticized, our first reaction is to get mad and angry. Right. But you have Mm. to be real and ask yourself because things aren't said for nothing. And the reality was it was true. So what was I going to do about it? You know what I mean? And that's, and I knew what I had to do. So what I did that following year, I left Vancouver. I moved here to Vernon. It's a little bit hillier. I dropped 15 pounds, hired a climbing coach, ate, breathed, slept, you know, climbing to become a superior climbing, worked on my power. And I came back the following season, not only winning hilly races, but setting new records on mountaintops, right? Wow. In one season, just, and the only thing I changed was what was happening up, upstairs. That was the only thing I changed, right? But don't forget, you know, I worked so hard for something. And then bang in 30 seconds in 2005, when I had the mother of all crashes, everything was gone. So you were going downhill at about a hundred kilometers an hour, right? And you flipped off the bike. Well, I was at a a big race. I was, that was the race kind of my deciding race. Was I going to sign with a, you know, European team or a big North American team? I was going to try one more race just to see, kind of gauge myself where I am against, you know, the better riders in the world. And as we were descending, like you said, close to like it was close to 90K an hour, um, other riders are starting to pack with us. And, you know, like, you know, when you see the Tour de France, when one rider goes down, it's like a domino effect. Right. So Mm. this rider comes, you know, as we're in this, you know, arrow position, she comes and rides in on my left hand side and she doesn't want to touch the center line because that'll give her a penalty. So she leans into me and at 85 kilometers an hour, 90 kilometers, I land on my face. I had an instant face lift, lips you know, ripped right off my clavicle, broken arms, broken legs, broken hips, broken from the friction of the fall. My first layer of skin was ripped right off. I mean, it was like basically taking a pretzel and just stepping on it. And I was lying there. Um, and I remember when I was going, coming in and out of consciousness, trying to hold pieces of my face because I could see it hanging there. Right. And honestly, that was the most scariest moment of my life. Cause I swear to God, I didn't think I was going to make it. I thought that was it. And I even started saying goodbyes to my mom, to my family, you know, to my friends, my coaches. I saw pictures of it. Yeah. It's it was pretty, a, pretty, like, pretty bad. Really. Yeah, it's no, pretty bad. it's pretty bad. <laughs> like, yeah. Cause I know in the interview with Rich, Rich was like, is it on video? And you said, no, it's, it's not, but there's pictures. I went and Googled yeah. it. I was like, Oh, I showed, I showed my wife. I was like, this is why I don't ride bikes. Yeah, exactly. You know? like, that's why I stick to running. Um, <laughs> Cause yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty full on. So it's, yeah, it's not good. <laughs> you, you get into, you decide to get into endurance riding, right? Like ultra yeah. ultra. And I, for me as an ultra runner, like in knowing your pedigree, like for me, it just makes sense, right? You got the military background, right? your, your competitive advantage is your mindset. Cause you know, I mean, you've shown that you're not always the most talented, but your ability to work. Right. And play the long game is where Leia Goldstein's strength really is. Right. And so to me, it just makes sense. And you're 42 and you decide to do the race across America, right? Right. Well, I mean, after the crash, I, I made my comeback because, you know, the diagnosis wasn't good. They said it was questionable about my ability wow. to walk properly without a walker or a cane, but it was unquestionable that I'll never race again. So remember, that was my diagnosis in 2005, but I had unfinished business. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? I still wanted to do these races. I wanted to win national champions, whatnot. So within a year, kind of to to speed up the story here, I was back on my bike and I had the best years as a professional racer after that crash at the ages of 39, 40, 41, and 42. Uh And that's when I retired. I had done everything I wanted to do. I reached all those goals and it was time to make that transition. And the reason why, because I always had kind of race across America in the back of my head. And I knew that I struggled in pro racing, you know, because it's kind of like a chess game. It's very much um, a team sport um, and there's many elements to it. But I knew when I transitioned into ultra endurance racing that I would excel pretty darn fast because of the three elements that are super important. And one, it's, it was my ability to really push myself beyond my limits. Two, I'm good with tolerating pain, handling pain, and three, I'm good with staying awake. I'm can be very functionable on very little sleep. And I knew those qualities are very important. And mind you too, in ultra endurance racing after, you know, so many hours, especially with race across America after, you know, 48 hours on the bike, it's no more physical, it's mental. Mm. Do you prefer to be alone? I know as a, you know, you had your crew and your team, but do you prefer to be alone out there? Well, I mean, 
With ultra endurance racing, yes, because with pro racing, I mean, when you are with the team, there is an expectation there. And sometimes my expectations might have been a little bit too high because I have high expectations on myself. So it was hard kind of sometimes for me to blend into a team, right? I mean, I got better as I progressed, right? And I, and I figured it out, right? But with race, you know, with any ultra, even in ultra endurance running, you are by yourself, right? And you are, you have the full control and you can't blame anybody else if it's not the outcome that you want. Right. And I think for me, having that control was very important because I knew what I needed, you know, the training and the, and the training I needed to go through, you know, to do these particular races. And then I could rely on that. And that helped me. But when you're with a team, you know, you're hoping and crossing your fingers that everybody is kind of on the same page as you and have that same mental ability to push themselves. So it's mm -hmm. a it's a hard transition. Right. You know what I mean? Especially if you're going from ultra into pro. But me coming into ultra endurance racing, I just kind of fit right in. So you had a multiple, uh, you had multiple goes at Ram and ultimately in 2021, you broke some records. You're 52 years old. There was ridiculous heat. Yeah. Can you walk us through the 2021 effort? Because <laughs> yeah. to yeah. me, well, I mean, the funny thing was it because it's okay. So we knew that the one thing that I lacked in the two other rams, right, is that yeah. I didn't do, I didn't climatize to the temperatures of the heat, the desert. I mean, I live in Canada, for God's sakes, you know what I mean? Like, what's the hottest it gets here? 30 mm -hmm. degrees, whatever, which is cold for, you know, people in the desert. So I went early to Borrego Springs to do some, to, you know, to work with the heat, you know, ride in temperatures of 46, you know, 47. But when I went there prior to like 10 days before, they had this, this, cold wave or whatever it was like 33 34 degrees and so i wasn't really benefiting it you know from that kind of training right because the day of the race the day of the race you know the first five hours we start on you know ocean side so the wind and the ocean is mm -hmm. nice and cool and it was like 33 something like that but as soon as i got to the glass elevator which is a basically a descent into the desert the temperature started going up and by the time i hit the bottom it was 48 celsius at 7 p.m and i kid you not i could feel the back of my eyeballs just burning it was on, I had never experienced anything like that. I mean, the most I had experienced in the other rounds were like 42, 43, which is still really difficult, mm. right? But mm. when you're starting at 47, I go, oh my God, this is going to be a journey. <laughs> you know what I mean, and the thing that was interesting this year too, because it was the hottest round they've ever experienced, um, it, it barely dropped even at nighttime. You barely got any, any retrieve. And the hardest part was going through Arizona. And I remember seeing, you know, the, my, my GPS or whatever on my bike reading 51 Celsius. And I mean, it was just excruciating. It was unbelievably difficult to turn those pedals. Yeah. It's interesting that that part of the country, I mean, there's a lot of ultra endurance r running races and uh, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of really good runners that mm -hmm. live and train in Flagstaff. And I suspect mm -hmm. it's just the, it's the terrain. It's the heat. Yeah. Right. I mean, it was, yeah. I mean, listen, only, and, and, and the interesting thing too, it wasn't just through Arizona. I mean, coming out of Arizona into Utah, into Colorado. I mean, I remember climbing Wolf Creek Pass, which is an 11,000 foot climb, and it was 35 degrees. I, you know what I mean? It was unbelievable. You, you barely got any reprieve from that kind of temperatures. Going back into Kansas, the it, heat was so intense that it burned right through my jersey. I mean, I got blisters. It was unbelievable. I mean, there's only three of us that finish, like three solo, and even. Mm. Um, the teams that they had pulled out of this, it was just unbelievable. You didn't see people. And if you saw somebody out there, you knew they'd have about a 20 minute window. Then they'd have to jump back into the car for the, you know, air conditioning or whatnot. So what we did basically is, I mean, I stayed out there as much as I could, like without going in the car as much as possible, maybe two or three times in a day just for five minutes. But we used basically an ice sock, you know, that we just filled with ice, put it around my neck. And then every five kilometers, one of my crew members would have a bottle of water and I just douse it over my head. Mm. And that's the only way you could ride across in those temperatures, right? Otherwise, and you know, you'd ride off, you'd dry off within, you know, five or 10 minutes. It was, and even the cockpit of the bike where the handlebars are and, you know, where the aero pads are, I couldn't touch it. I couldn't put my hands there without, you know, cooling it down with water. It was that hot. It was unbelievably crazy, crazy, something I had never experienced before. Ultimately, you win it and set a female record, right? 
No, I, 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 I win it. I, I, uh, I'm the first woman to break the, well, to win it in 39 years, but I didn't no, no records were broken there. I mean, you couldn't ride fast when you're, you know, even when you're in a race, when it's, mm. you know, 45, you're not going to set any records, right? Because with Race Cross America, you need to break a 10 day record. You need conditions to be in your favor. Right. And not mm. only um, did we suffer with the heat, but also I had a little bit more headwind than I would normally had in the, mm. my past rounds. Right. Going right through Kansas for 19 hours, I was fighting a pretty ferocious headwind. Right. So, you know, all those little elements, whatever, it's going to slow you down, you know. And so but. I mean, for, for the most, mind you, too, I wasn't the favorite to win. The favorite to win was Mark from, from the United Kingdom, right? Mm. I mean, we were basically back and forth after Kansas because I was in the lead, you know, up into Kansas, and then he passed me, and that's kind of when the, the real race started. It's incredible. <clears throat> I mean, I know that you're going back to try to get the 10 days. Mm -hmm. I believe you are. Uh, so we'll be watching that. But I think what's incredible is to – Think about a race where you're in basically Kansas, which is the middle of America, mm -hmm. and you're in a competitive process with another individual for almost the rest of the continent. Like to kind of comprehend that is incredible. And as we start to bring it to a close, there's really some three questions I want to ask you. Um, one relates to the last comment I made. Okay. When you're in your pain cave. Yep. Because um, now this is for the athletes out there that don't quit. But right. when you're in that pain cave, <clears throat> sometimes it's easy to just say, I just want to finish. I don't want to compete anymore. Right. How do you stay with a competitive mindset versus I'm just going to finish mindset? Well, I mean... Do you know what I mean? I, I know exactly what you're talking about, right? And that's where your training comes in hand, right? You know, that I train and I try to replicate the things I'm going to feel um, both physically and mentally during my training. So I'm more prepared for, for Race Cross America. But of course, you can't do a T, you know. Mm. And I think, too, is that, you know, it's kind of redirecting your focus, right? Because I, I get that. I, I've done that too. Like, oh, I just want to finish this damn race, right? Mm. But I know that if I kind of were to throw in the white towel in regards to that, that I would get across that finish line, right? You know what I mean? And that would bug me for the rest of my life. So I think, you know, you have to think about and put yourself back into perspective when you are in that kind of state of mind of why you're there and what did what have you done to get there? You know, so when I reflect back on how much training and how much sacrifice and what I'm even putting my crew through, you know what I mean? To just say, OK, mm -hmm. we'll just finish. It's not good enough. They don't deserve it and I don't mm -hmm. deserve it. So I think you have to have confidence in yourself because don't forget with Race Across America, too. I mean, it's a completely different beast, right? You're not only physically and mentally tired, but you're sore and you're hallucinating. You know, you're uncomfortable and you just have to learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable for most of the race. Right. And kind of keep your, you know, your crap together. So it's it is challenging and it is a roller coaster ride. Right. You know what I mean? So. You're, and you're going to have probably more bad days than good days. That's what I'm saying is that with Race Across America, it is 80% mental and the rest of it is just physical. So, you know, like I said, is is relying on your training and doing things that you're kind of going to experience during the race. I think that's key to kind of come mm. prepared for it, right? Mm. But also, you know, you know, a good example too is, you know, when you do a marathon for the first time, say, oh, I'll never do it again and I hate it and whatnot, right? And then two days later, I'll have to do it again, right? You know what I mean? You're already so, signing up. Yeah, You're, always, you're already race, signing yeah. up because mentally you already know what to do and you can learn. So I always say you want to do things twice. Like don't just give up the first time and hate it, right? Because you learn so much when you do it the second time, it'll always be better. You'll know what to do. You'll know better how to prepare. You know what I'm saying? And, and to, to gauge yourself, right? That's why I had to come back and do Ram again, because I knew from the first time so many things how, you know, we could have perfected, right? And we, and I'm still learning, right? With things like that. So like I'm saying, you know, when you have those hard times is you're coming to that starting line. And then if you can say to yourself, there's nothing else I could have done to prepare myself, then you're in good hands, then you're good. Right. And there's nothing that should stop you. Right. And I, and again, just prepare yourself for those lows and think about how you're going to get through it. Just think about it. that's where the mental training comes in. Mm. You have a unique relationship with quitting. Like you don't quit. I don't. Now, <laughs> what is your fear about quitting? 
because I know that many of us that don't like to quit, there's a fear there. And I'm interested to know what your fear is about quitting. Well, I mean, personally, I don't think quitting should ever be an option unless, of course, it's life threatening. Then we're talking about two different things here. Right. You know, but I believe, honestly, that whatever you choose to do in your life, you know, I don't care if it's a sport or, you know, something in business or music, you have to get to your finish line. Like for me and my thing, let's just say with Weights Cross America, even if I didn't make the 12 days, let's just say, right, something happened. I would still write it, even if it took me 20 days, because I think patterns are often repeated. When you quit once, it's way easier to do it again. And when you get through those difficult times, man, God, it makes you strong. It's like when you break a bone, it heals stronger. And it's the same thing. You get to your finish line, no matter, even if it's not the, what the outcome that you want, you get to that finish line. And at least you can say you gave it your best shot. Yeah, I'm with you, Leia. It's always um, interesting when I look at the the professionals, and I understand, like in ultra running, it's a career for them. But like they'll 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 do not fin they won't finish if they blow up. Now, right. Like I I just don't understand that. But again, I understand that for them, right. they're on a different journey. Right. Um, they're trying to go as hard as they can. If they blow up, they blow up. But for right. me, if I blow up, I'm still getting that finish. Like I'll have to be airlifted off that yeah. mountain. Right? <laughs> Somebody's going to have to carry me. Well, I mean, most of us aren't getting paid $2 million. <laughs> yes. Well, that's the thing, right? Yeah. yeah I mean, most of us are there for personal reasons, right? But mm. I think too, and if you don't, like I said, get to your finish line, you'll regret it. And that's the worst feeling in the world, right? But like I said, sometimes you just got to dig deep. And like I said, at least you can say you gave it your best shot. And that means something. I agree. How do you know when you need to change direction and you're quitting for the right reason? Well, like, like you, I said, right? When well, I mean, if it's, if it's life threatening, then for sure. Like no, I don't mean, I don't mean in that. I mean more so like how, when you transition from Taekwondo to kickboxing, from kickboxing to the military, like how did you have the wisdom or insight to realize you're not quitting, you're evolving. Right. Does well, I mean, I, I believe there's a life to everything. Right. For sure. I mean, like, you know, with kickboxing, it, like take that sport, for example, I mean, you get hit a lot in the head. Right. You know what I mean? Like not so much in the in the in the fights, you know, because I was undefeated. and I won. It's the training, you know. And so you don't want to get past that point where it's going to affect you later. I mean, there is life after kickboxing. There's life after Taekwondo. There's life after cycling. Right. And part of the reasons why, too, I, you know, I, I left pro racing is because I can't afford to crash anymore. Mm -hmm. I had one crash too many. Right. You know what I mean? And I don't want to, you know to do stupid things that will affect the rest of my life. Right. And I think, you know, and another good point too, is if you're not enjoying it anymore and you're dwelling and you go, Oh damn. And you're hating it. Then maybe it's time to, <laughs> to transition. Right. You know, that's why I said, you know, so don't consume yourself with it. Like I like my cycling season, but I like my off season as well, where I do other things and I'm not, I want to see the bike. I want to hear the bike. I want to talk about the bike kind of in the fall, you know, early winter. I do other things, hike with my dogs. I like to run, you know what I mean? Just to explore it and, and do other things that you, you haven't done before. Right. And so when you come back to your sport or whatever you're doing, you're refreshed and you're recharged. Right. But I find people like, especially pro racers, they're really bad for us. All they want to do is ride the damn bike and talk about the bike. I don't want to hear anything about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm. Everybody needs that recharge. Right. And you, and then you, then, you, you know, you almost want to miss it more. So you're hungry for it again. Mm. Right? So I think that'll help prolong it. And also, you know, for your body too, it's not great just to sit on a bike and pedal. It's that non weight bearing sport, right? You know, so you kind of want to have the balance there with incorporating like running or strength training and whatnot, you know, and of course try other things. And, you know, I think that that will help keep the balance too. But like I said, I think when you no longer have the motivation to train for whatever you're doing, then it's time to transition. Yeah. It's a really good insight there. Leia, and I think what we will do is we'll bring it to a close. But before we do, I just really want to thank you for your time. Love your energy. Love your story. Oh, thank such you. A power, yeah, such a powerful example, I think, for everyone in the Ultra Habits community, guiding their careers, guiding, you know, their sport life, their family life, just really bringing all they can to everything they do. So, again, we really appreciate you. Thank you for coming on the show. Where can we find you, Leia? What, what are you doing next? What do you have on the go? Well, um, actually, the documentary is coming out uh, probably in April. So we're working on that right now. And then the second book as well. So that's probably more in the summertime. And you can just go to my website, leiagoldstein.com. All right. Well, thank you so much, Leia. We really, really appreciate you at Ultra Thank Habits you. Camp. It was a real pleasure talking with you. Thank you for having me.